Today we're going to derive the area moment of inertia, which is often indicated with the letter I. Okay, and usually with like a little, a lot of times with two X's to indicate I relative to some axis X. Sometimes it's I sub C to, to indicate with, re, re, with respect to the centroid. Um, you'll see a lot of different uh, formulations of it, but the, but the real key here is I, the area moment of inertia. And what we're talking about is, you know, a beam's or something's ability to resist, um, resist bending. Um, and so what we're thinking about here, so when we think bending, so there's got to be a moment applied in some way, shape, or form. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm, I'm going to draw, you know, I've got this kind of like this bar here. And it's being, it's got a moment applied to the top and a moment applied to the bottom. And so what I want to think about is how much will it bend and how much is the shape going to affect that. So if I think about this shape right here of this frontal bit right here. Okay, hopefully, you know, we've already got some intuition about this, which is that, like, let's imagine that shape was like this. Let's make that, uh, like, five squares, okay? Versus if I took that same board and I laid it down flat, like this. Okay, I think that you can imagine, if I have the same force and I applied them to both of them, that this one right here is going to bend a lot more than this one. Right now, of course, it's got some disadvantages, which like maybe if I'm trying to walk on it, maybe this one's a little bit harder to walk on. But generally, this one is the winner, right? It's not going to bend as much. Okay, now the question is why? Okay, and why in that regard do we often build, instead of either of these two shapes, we often build something with this, if I had the same cross-sectional area, now clearly I can't draw that right now, but we often build something called an I-beam, right? And it looks something like this, okay? And so this is what happens. So if I apply this moment on either end, you know, of this thing. So if I want to do some statics on this, I could say the sum of the forces equals zero because I don't have any forces. And the sum of the moments equals zero because I've got a positive moment um, on the right and I've got a negative moment on the left. And so they cancel out. But what's going to happen is this bottom bit, right, it's going to stretch, right? Or at least it's going to, it's going to bend, right? So I'm going to draw it like this okay, as best I can. And then, and then, of course, you know, these, these sides are no longer going to be where I drew them. They're going to kind of do like this, okay? Now, imagine, imagine this is a straight line, okay? And then maybe we, maybe we draw something that looks like this. So to the best of my ability, which is clearly not very good, um, it does something like that. Now, what I want you to note here is that this bottom thing right here, so if, you, so, so if I give my points my my corners points a b c d notice that c d the original c d was a straight line but the new c d okay is now a curved line and it is longer than the original okay so it is lengthened and so by lengthening lengthened on the bottom so by lengthening it is now in tension it's pulling back against the fact that you know it has been that the board has been bent Okay, now what about on the top? Well, on the top, okay, notice this particular uh, portion of the board, okay, it has shortened. Okay, now if it's shortened, then it is in compression. Okay, now logically that should also kind of tell you that there's a point somewhere in here where it will, it is neither, neither lengthened nor shortened, and it's actually just you know, chilling. It's fun. Okay, and this is called the centroidal axis because it goes through the centroid of the shape. Okay, so we'll call it the centroidal axis. And everything above that is in compression and everything below that is in tension. And a lot of times they, they draw this, they'll, um, you know, they'll draw a little line like this and they'll kind of indicate what's going on here by doing something along these lines, showing that, you know, this bit is in tension. And this bit as the opposite sign is in compression. Okay. All right. Um, and I'm not actually sure the sign convention. I'm not sure if they draw those like this. Um, I should probably look that up for this video, but um, it's not really a critical point here. Um, and so what we want to do here is we want to think, well, how does the shape resist that, right? And so what's going on here, the reason we use a Y beam is because notice where there's the most compression right up here at the top. Okay, we have a whole bunch of area to resist that. Okay, and where we have a whole bunch of tension right here at the bottom, we have all this area down here to resist that. 
okay? So what I want to do is I want to think about a little sliver of this. So the sliver at the end that's got this that's got this moment being applied to it. So this little sliver right here, maybe. Okay, I want to think about this little sliver on the end. Okay, and so I'm going to draw it again down here, and, and we're going to think about what's going on here. Okay, so here's this little sliver. I'm trying to make it as big as possible. Okay. And now I've got this moment that's being applied. Oh, well, you know, of course my fingers slip right there, you know, but anyway, I've got a moment that's being applied on the end. It looks like this. Okay, now what's resisting that moment? Well, I've got, um, I've got a bunch of forces um, that are inside the beam that are pushing back, right? So I just kind of, and, and I'll explain to you how I know that they have this shape in a second. But basically, all of this stuff is pushing back this way, like this, okay? And all of this stuff down here, okay, it's pulling back this way. Okay, now how do I know that the bottom bit is pulling? Well, because I said it's in tension. And how do I know the top bit is in compression? Well, because I said it was in compression, so it's pushing. Okay, and the further up towards this top you go, the more it compresses, and the, and the, the closer down to this bottom bit, the more it tensa, tenses. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to this. So this, this could be like a little free body diagram of that little sliver, free body diagram. Okay, and we're gonna come back to this because this is where most of our work on what it is that we're doing is gonna come from. But first, I wanna try to get at how do we know like how strong the force is, say, in this little bit of this sliver, right? So if I wanted to know, if I was just interested in this bit right here, how would I get at how, you know, what was going on there? Why is it pushing back? Okay. And so I want to go back over here to something that you guys may remember from like physics class, which was Hooke's Law. Okay. And Hooke's Law, had, Hooke's Law had to do with springs. And so usually what would happen is you would have a spring. So here's our, our spring right here, and it's got something attached to it. And we would say, well, here's the, the, the force of the spring equals negative K, which is a spring constant, spring constant. And basically it tells you how strong is the spring, okay? And then we would stretch the spring some amount or compress it some amount, and that would tell us what the force was. So in this case, for example, if the spring constant was, I don't know, if, if uh, little k was, let's say little k is uh, 10 newtons per meter, Okay, and I stretch this thing um, two meters. Okay, then I could say, okay, well then Fs in this case, right here, the Fs on this from the spring is negative, so the K is 10 newtons per meter. Okay, times the change in distance from, and this is the distance from, you know, equilibrium or whatever, from its original position. Okay, and so that might be two meters. Right, so you could say, well, the force in the spring is negative 20 newtons. Okay, and so there you go, boom. Okay, and that's how this, how that's how this thing works. Okay, now I want you to think about that over here. Okay, look, we've compressed something. It's not a spring. It might be made of concrete. It might be made of bubble gum, for all I know. But however, when you compress it, it has a tendency to push back. Okay, we've also tensed, tensiled, tensioned something. Tensed it. I don't know. Anyway. And when you, when you pull on it, it's going to do the same thing, just like this spring, okay? So we need a law that um, we, could use, we could have done this with Hooke's Law, but I don't want to do this with Hooke's Law. I want to do this with a law whose name I don't know, cause, just because I can't remember it, and I'm looking it up, and I can't find it. Um, you know, I, I just call it the stress-strain relationship. Um, you know, to be sure, it's usually written this way, sigma equals E times epsilon, okay? Whereas this, you know, this is epsilon right here, and this is the the sigma, okay. But I, I don't I don't really want to I don't want to think about it in the, in, in those terms right now, okay? Because that's just muddying the water, so we're just going to kind of ignore that. Um, anyway, so what we have here is is for a given material, okay, the force per unit area. So basically, what this means is okay. So I want you to think kind of like these springs up here, but instead I've just got a beam, okay, and it's made of something. Who knows what it's made of, but it's got a material, it's got, it's a material, right? So just like up here, we have a spring and, um, down here, I just have something else, right? And so maybe I, maybe I'm stretching it. 
Okay, and so I'm applying a force over a little area right here. So there's a frontal area right here. Okay, and so what that's doing is that's applying a pressure on the front right here. And what it's going to do ultimately is, so I, I drew this one in tension, but we could, we could have just as easily have gone in um, compression, is that this, this beam is gonna get a little bit longer, right? Now who knows how much longer? Okay, but that's gonna depend just like in the case of this spring up here, it's gonna depend on the properties of the spring. So in this case, it's gonna depend on the properties of the, the beam, right? So in this case, one of the things we need is we need a property of the beam. So this little thing right here, this E, which is called Young's modulus, Young's modulus, okay? Use that to impress somebody at a party, um, is essentially a spring constant for something that is not a spring. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated because it, it doesn't necessarily, um, well, anyway, it's a little more complicated. But for now, just think of it as a spring constant, okay? And then, you know, and then once you kind of get at that, then what's left is, well, how much did this length change? Okay, so, well, I made a change on both ends, so we'd have to account for both of those. But how much did the total length change relative to the original length? So you can think of this thing as a percent change in length. Okay, so like if delta L over L ends up being like 0.1, that means we had a 10% change in length. Okay, so this little equation right here, you know, this tells you that the force required or the force of resistance, depending on how you look at it, um, equals, I'm going to leave that E out front, A, times this percent change in length over L. Okay, now this is really no different from Hooke's law. It's just uglier. Okay, so we're going to use that in a second, um, but this is a, this is a, 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 a Hooke's law for just any material. Okay, um, so we're going to hold on to that, and the reason we're going to hold on to that is because let's look what's going on here, right? I could I could treat each of these as individual springs, right? Like I've got a little spring following this red line right here. You could think of it that way. It's not a spring; it's something else. But what we know for sure is that it's been compressed, and so it's pushing back, right? And so it's pushing back right here, okay, with a little force, right, F. Okay, well, I should have, <laughs> I could have written that a little bit closer, right? So it's pushing back with a little force, okay? That is equivalent to, and that force can be defined based on essentially how much it compresses, okay, how much it compresses right here. Okay, and then um, this, you know, what it's made of and how much of it is kind of in that, that's, you know, that cross section. Okay, so we can kind of, um, well, let's see. So let's, let's go back to our original, uh, you know what, let's, let's clean this one up a little bit first. Okay, so, um, so for something that's bending, right, this is a little bit more interesting, at least in my opinion. So here we go. Here's something that's bending, right? And here's how we would um, solve for something that is bending, right? So we want to kind of make this for, you know, a layer of a bending um, beam, okay? So let's suppose, and, it, and I'm going to use the top layer Okay, and so what we've got here is we've got this distance from here to here, okay, to the centroidal axis. And I'm going to call that distance capital R. Oh, sorry, capital R. <laughs> I kept staring at it, you know, I had a little, little brain. Okay, and then from there, I've got an R that measures this way, a little r. Okay. And so what that means is, so this, the length of this centroidal axis right here, okay, um, the length is, well, let's see, we need an angle here. So the original length of the bar, okay, is the length of this arc right here. And so that's going to be capital R times theta. Okay, oh, come on, man. No need to jump around like that. And then the length of this compressed bit right here Okay, that length is, well, it's going to be, well, we need this arc length. So that's capital R minus little r 
times theta. Okay. So in that case, the um, let's see here. The, so we can say then that the change in length is r minus r times theta minus r theta. So this is the final minus the initial. Okay, now what's cool here, I think, is that, let's see here, so we end up with the change in length equals, if we kind of, you know, do some algebra here, negative r theta. Okay, so in this case, it got shorter, which, of course, we knew that already. Okay, and the initial looks like this. So for that thing over there where I've got uh, delta L over L, well, L is R theta, okay, and delta, uh, excuse me, and change in length, oh, sorry, change in length equals negative R theta. So these thetas go away, and the change in length over length is the little r over the big R, where the little r is just how far we are from the centroidal axis. Okay, so let's, um, so let's go back over here. Let's look at this thing. Okay, so now the F equals E A, okay, times the little r. It's got a negative sign over it, over the capital R. Cool. Okay, so basically this little r comes from the fact that, in this case, it's, it's how far are you from that centroidal axis. The farther you are from the centroidal axis, the bigger this little r is, and so the more compression you get, or tension, and so the larger this thing, you know, the larger this force of resistance is. Okay, so that's cool. So we go back over here, and um, I'm going to go ahead and plug that in, E A R over R. Okay, so instead of this force, okay, we're going to say the force equals, um, I'm, not, I'm going to ignore the negative sign because I'm kind of taking care of that in my head, R over R. Okay, so that matches what we have over here, E A R over R. So we're just ignoring that negative sign. Okay, now note that this is, you know, we kind of have this running all along down here. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of little forces here uh, pushing, and we have a whole bunch of little forces here pulling. Okay, so all of those, if I do the sum of the moments here, well, let's see here, and then what's the moment from that little force? Well, okay, so the sum of the moments on this thing right here, that has to equal to zero, or else this thing would be uh, moving, right? Um, it would be act actively spinning, um, and it's not actively spinning. It spun a little bit until these forces kind of cropped up, and so now we've got um, this moment, which we note is positive, so we've got M, Okay, and then we've got um, minus, okay, if we notice this force is kind of, or this mo these are all creating a, a, a negative moment, um, E, A, R on R, and then what's the, um, what's this, you know, this moment arm here for our little, our little uh, segment here, our little moment arm here is little r, right, little r. Okay, so that's our moment arm. So again, we've got two R's. This R is just a moment arm. Let me zoom in so we can talk about that. This little, this little R, the one that I just wrote there, that's a moment arm. And this R right here, that is because the farther away you get from the centroidal axis, <coughs> the greater the, the compression or tension um, in the beam. Okay, so um, I, don't, I don't know how to write that uh, succinctly. Okay, so what we're going to do, so what we're thinking about here is we're summing all of these, right, from, you know, all of these. So not just one little block. Now I'm thinking about all these little blocks. And all of them collectively, okay, all of these little forces and these little forces collectively resist this moment. Okay, and so we can say equals zero. Okay, and I just I just wrote a summation there. We could we could do this just as easily and perhaps more correctly. Um, well, well, I'm just going to use it as a summation for now. We'll use it as a summation. Okay, like that. Um, okay, so now we get if we bring that over to the other side, the moment equals the summation of E A on R little R squared. Okay, and so this is kind of where we were heading, and um, so um, what this kind of works out to is, and I'm gonna, I'm now gonna switch into, you know, I'm gonna change this into an integral. 
And so the way that this typically works out, and the way that this is typically written, because remember, these, this little area that I've written, this is a small little area, right? So it's just one of those little areas of those little tiny things, right? So, um, you know, whatever you want to call it, usually we would call it a DA. So typically this is written as um, E over R. Okay, and then this thing is the integral of r squared dA. Okay, and that's typically how this is done. Okay, now all of this right here, this is i. Okay, and so what I like to do when I think about this is I, I, think, this, I think of this as, okay, so this, if we write this simply, m equals e i times 1 over r. Okay, now the, um, so this is, so the analogy that I like to do, okay, is I, I like to do, draw an analogy between force equals mass times acceleration. Okay, and uh, I'll explain what I mean right there. Okay, this is, what's, this is what's driving the change in the system. Okay, so in this case, the force may be pushing on a mass or something. In this case, the moment is trying to bend the, um, is trying to bend the, um, whatever you might, you know, bend the beam. Okay, um, these things right here, okay, these are the resistors, right? And it just so happens that in the moment equation, we've got two of them. So these are resistors, meaning, you know, the larger this is, so essentially the, you know, the stiffer the beam, okay? So I call this the stiffness, okay? The stiffer the beam is, the less it's going to bend, okay? Or the, uh, the more efficient the, the shape is, or the, or the larger the shape, the more correct the shape is, okay, the, the less it's gonna change. And of course, down here, we've got the mass. And the larger the mass is, the less it's gonna accelerate. And this right here is the reaction, okay? The reaction, okay? This one happens to be a, um, you know, a, um, a vector. In this case, 1 over r, that is just how much it bends. Okay, how much does it bend? Okay, and the acceleration, of course, is just an acceleration. So like that 1 over r, if we think about it, it looks like this. You know, so this might be one particular bending. With r being from here to here, that could be r. Okay, but we also might get for example, a much bigger R, if we draw almost the exact same beam, but it bends almost not at all, right? So now we notice that, look, R is much bigger. I mean, obviously this is not a perfect drawing, but now R from, you know, that vertex to here is much, much, much bigger, okay? So in this case, one over R, one over R is small, in this case, 1 over r is big, okay? So note that this is a large reaction, okay? So, so that's how this all works, okay? So that's how you should think about it, and we just need to remember that i equals the integral of r squared dA, okay? Where r is how far from it doesn't have to be the centroidal axis, but whatever the axis um, this thing is bending around, axis bending around, the thing is bending around. Okay, and that's how this whole, all this works. Okay, that's it. It's 24 minutes. I don't know how many of y'all watch it because I'm going to tell you it's optional, but um, it's there for you. So um, I hope it's uh, helpful. All right, take it easy, guys. Bye.